and start to you say in faith there is victory. Where is your heart? Thank you for tuning in to Focus on Faith with your host, Russ Vickers. Good day, everyone, and welcome back to Focus on Faith. I'm your host, Russ Vickers, and we're glad to have you today on our program and, and joining us in our Bible study today. It means an awful lot to us that you're here. We invite you to take your Bibles and follow along with us, as today we have Brother Ryan Manning, and he's going to be talking about God's command to the church. Ryan is the Associate Minister for the Somerville, Tennessee Congregation, and we're delighted to have him in the studio today. We're glad to have you. Ryan, let's begin. Thank you, Russ. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Bible says that Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Here we have the Great Commission. This is God's command to the church. And from here we see a very important thing that Christians must do. I want us to look uh, from each of these verses and see what God wants of us as Christians. First of all, from verse 18, we must recognize Jesus' power. When Jesus rose from the dead, God gave him all authority. In verse 18, Jesus spoke to them and he said, All power or all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. This means that Jesus has the power to do whatever he desires and he has the right to request what he wants other people to do. We, as those under him, have to follow what he does or what he says. We have the responsibility to obey his requests. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays to the Father and he says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And in Romans 14, 8 and 9, we read, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. So Jesus came to this earth so that he would die or so that he could die to save man. And in doing that, he was given all power, all authority over everything on this earth. We therefore must obey him. And we must recognize that authority as we go through life. He has the right to give us a command. In verse 19, Jesus says, Go ye therefore. And the therefore indicates that Jesus gave the great commission because he has all authority. Because he has the right to make this command. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God exalted Jesus when he died and was raised again, and God gave him a name above all names. Why? So that every knee should bow. That's your knee. That's my knee. And, that is, uh, and those are the knees of the people in the world that he has sent us to. Jesus is king, and therefore we must follow him, but we must also spread the message so that others can follow him. Instead of living their lives in such a way where they defy his authority, Jesus wants everybody to comply with his authority. What do we confess? He says that, that every knee needs to bow, and he says that every tongue should confess. And if you think about Romans chapter 10, how it talks about uh, confession, the Bible says that we need to confess the Lord Jesus, confess that he is our Lord. Now, since God intends on every tongue confessing Christ, 
meaning that every person living in the time of Christ and everyone who would live after, how will the masses, how will the people of this world learn to confess his name and his lordship? Do we have any command given? Well, look at the next verse. In Matthew chapter 18, we see verse 19, and it gives us the commission. It gives us the command to go into all the world. Now, the commission was originally given to the apostles, but it shows us how God intends to spread the good news to every person. If Jesus has all authority and every knee should bow, every tongue should confess, then obviously the command, the commission that was given to the apostles still applies to us today. So, in our second for, the, for our second point, or in the second place, let us look at verse 19. And the point is, make disciples of all nations. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing in them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave a main command in this passage. Go, and, and he says, teach all nations. That is the main command. And all of the other commands in this passage focus uh, or, or revolve around this. The word teach here actually means to make disciples, which means that God wanted his disciples, his followers, to make more. He wanted them to... Uh, he wanted them to continue to make more followers of him. Christianity, then, should always continue to grow. And every new generation has the responsibility to spread God's word. The other commands in verses 19 and 20 actually describe the things involved with making disciples. You have to go make disciples. And what does making disciples involve? Well, it involves baptism for the remission of sins, and it involves teaching. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. How should we do that? Well, God made his will clear on this matter. He made his will clear on this matter. He wants, first of all, he wants everybody to find salvation. And the main command in Matthew 28, 19 tells us that. In 2 Peter 3, 9, we see that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In Luke 10, 2, Therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest that he would or pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Now how will God find salvation? Think of some of the think of some of the, the possible ways. Either God will tell everybody by himself. Or he will tell some people by himself, or he will entrust the message to someone else to give. If we can find one person who responded to human preaching, and we can in the Bible, we have numerous accounts of that, then we can rule the first option out, that God will tell every single person how to be saved. The second option, that God is going to tell some people but not others, that fails because God says that he does not show partiality. Acts 10.34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. So we must accept the third option, that God has given someone else the responsibility to spread the gospel. He put the gospel in our hands. But he does not go up to people, whisper in their ears, give them a still small voice in their heads or some mysterious thing that they hear. He does not do that. Instead, he gives us the command to go to spread the word of God. Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? God had the opportunity to tell man what to do, and yet he sent men instead to make disciples. Think of Acts chapter 9, where Saul, on the road to Damascus, falls to the ground blinded 
and speaking to the Lord. In verse 14, or I'm sorry, in verse 30, uh, verse 6 of Acts chapter 9, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? What did the Lord say unto him? Did he say, actually, I would like you to hear the plan of salvation. Actually, I would like you to uh, let me tell you that you need to hear the word of God, believe, repent that, uh, of your sins, confess, and be baptized to have your sins washed away. Now, did Saul need to do those things? Of course, but what did Jesus tell him to do? The Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And then God told Ananias, There's somebody that you need to meet. On another occasion, in Acts chapter 8, Philip, he's preaching, he's successful, and God tells him you need to go because somebody needs to hear the word of God. There was an Ethiopian eunuch, and he was uh, riding home on his chariot from Jerusalem, and he needed to hear the word of God. Now the Spirit could have easily told him, here's what you need to do. You need to learn of Christ, here are the scriptures you need. That would be nothing for God to do. It's certainly not too, uh, too difficult for him to do. God who can create the world can certainly tell one person. However, in Acts 8, 29, the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip had the responsibility of preaching Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch. The sinful world needs us. We need to go, we need to proclaim the gospel if the world is to have any chance of finding salvation. That falls upon us. That falls upon the servants of God who have the word of God. Now what happens if we ignore our responsibility to warn sinners of their ways? Well, Ezekiel 3.18 says, When I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speaks to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at thy hand. So if we ignore the responsibility to get up, to go into all the world, then that is on us. The command then was make disciples of all nations. Now, how do we fill that command? How do we uh, rather carry out that command? Go ye therefore and make disciples or teach all nations. Now look at this. Here's how. By baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit and teaching them to have observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. As we saw earlier, Jesus gave one imperative, make disciples. The next two things he mentioned, baptism and teaching, show us the things involved with making those disciples. Baptism puts us into Christ. Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you as, has been as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Revelation 1.5 talks about those who have been washed in the blood. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us in our, or washed us from our sins, rather, in his own blood. We need the blood of Christ if we are to have our sins washed away. The Bible shows us that we cannot wash away our sins by ourselves. We need the blood of Christ, and we need the atonement that His blood can give us. Now, how do we contact the blood of Christ? Think for a moment about Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4. It says, Do you not know, or know you not, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, 
that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So we contact the blood of Christ. How? It says when you are baptized into Christ, you are baptized into his death. Notice there that the act of baptism puts us into Christ and it brings us before the cross of Christ. Jesus shed his blood on the cross. He went and he died a painful death because of our sins. He did that for me. He lived on this earth, sacrificing his position in heaven, giving that up so that he could humble himself. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 tells us he humbled himself. He took upon himself the form of, the ser of a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Why did he do that? He did that because he needed to shed his blood. Leviticus 17.11 tells us that blood is required for atonement. In the Old Testament, God gave the blood upon the altar so that it would make atonement for the sins of the people. In the New Testament, we don't have the blood of bulls and goats. We have the blood of Jesus Christ, and he shed that blood for us. Now, when we go and we make disciples of all nations... It is our goal, our responsibility to baptize them. Why? Because only in baptism can one contact the healing, the, the washing, the cleansing blood of Christ. We must also teach the loss of the world before they can become disciples of Christ, before they can become Christians. When do we teach people like this commission commands. You know, it says, go and, and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And go, and, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. When does that teaching take place? Does it take place before baptism or does it take place after baptism? Well, yes. It takes place before and after baptism. Because it's not saying that you need to go, you need to teach, baptize, and teach. It's saying you need to make disciples. And the way you do that is by baptizing and by teaching. People need to be taught who God is. People need to be taught who Christ is. People need to be taught who the Holy Spirit is. They need to be taught about the church that Christ built. They need to be taught about the blood of Christ. They need to be taught about how to live right. But once we become Christians, we don't need to stop learning. In fact, the very last verse in the book of 2 Peter, Peter tells us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The book of 2 Peter was written to non-Christians or Christians? It was written to Christians. And Christians have to continue to grow. They have to continue to learn. In each one of us, or in each one of our journeys, we have a responsibility to continue to learn. And we have the responsibility to pass those things that we have learned along to the next generation. We need teaching before baptism. Look at Acts 8.35. It says, Then P Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Did the Ethiopian eunuch need to learn something? As he rode in his chariot, he studied the book of Isaiah. He read Isaiah 53 and he saw the suffering of God's servant. And he asks, who was Isaiah speaking of? Was he speaking of himself or somebody else? And Philip taught him. He started there. And he taught him Jesus. He preached to him Jesus. But we also need teaching after baptism. Acts 2.42 says that they, 
the new Christians continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Wait, they continued in the apostles' doctrine? What were the apostles doing? They were teaching that doctrine. And the Christians were learning everything that they could so that they could live their lives according to what they learned. How should we go and make disciples? Matthew 10, 32 tells us, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. When we think about the plan of salvation, we think about how before one becomes a Christian, one has to hear God's word, one has to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. One has to repent of his sins. One has to confess the name of Christ. Confess the Lordship of Christ, like Romans 10.9 says. And then one has to be baptized. But do you know that you have to continue with those things? Should the confession be limited to before you get up? To be ba or when you get up and before you go into the baptistry, should it be limited to where you stand before the preacher and say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Then you go, you get baptized, and you never make that confession again. Should we? Or should we continue to confess the name of Christ? I believe that evangelism is a form of confession. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men. What is evangelism if it's not confessing Christ before others? Go back to Philippians chapter 2, and it says that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's why Jesus came to this earth. And that is our mission our goal is to confess our belief in Christ and to pass that along. Not our belief, but the reasons why we believe so that people can form a belief of their own and make their good confession. And then what's their responsibility? They need to take what they believe to others. We don't confess our beliefs to others simply to let them know where we stand. We confess to others so that they will glorify God by confessing themselves. 1 Peter 3.15 says, but, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We must always stand ready to answer those who ask us, why do you have hope in this world? Why do you go on in this world? We should always have an answer ready. Unfortunately, and it's a shame that I, have, that I can say this, but unfortunately, many people are not ready to give an answer. Many people are not ready to give that kind of confession, and, and, and instead they think that their confessing days are over when they make that statement before they are baptized. But that is not the case. Christ has given us a commission. He has given the church a command, and it goes out to each one of us, to each one of the soldiers of Christ. And that command is to arise and to take the gospel to all the world. Thank you so much. Ross, back to you. Ryan, that was an outstanding lesson. Thank you so much for bringing that to us today. You know, we know from the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, that Jesus Christ indeed has all authority in heaven and on earth. And, and Jesus said back in Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Uh, the idea of Jesus having all authority in Matthew 28 goes back to Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 7, 14, which says, And there was given him dominion and glory 
and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and His kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now that sounds an awful lot like the church, doesn't it? And Christ being the head of the church with all authority, with all power. Isn't it great to know that we serve a Savior and we have a Savior who has that kind of authority? Because Jesus has all authority to give commands. And the command to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Uh, the emphasis on how people hear the Word of God and gain faith, Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God is by someone teaching them what to do to be saved. Baptism puts us into Christ, as Ryan said. And either you're in Christ or you're outside of Christ. There is no middle ground to it. Uh, we either either in or out. And because of Christ's authority, we can be confident and we can be assured that Christ is King and Lord of all. Also, being assured that while we fulfill God's command to the church, He is with us always as we work in the kingdom. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28, verse 20. Now it is our duty to pass these teachings of Christ on to others. The idea of why do we believe as we do? Why do we worship without instruments? Why do we partake of the Lord's Supper each and every Lord's Day? Why do we give each Lord's Day as commanded? These are things that future generations need to know about. These are things that others need to know about. You know, when you think about it, God's plan is the best. God's way is truly the best. Christ has universal authority. Christ has a universal message, and Christ has given us a universal mission. And so with those three things, the authority, the message, and the mission, we are to go forth teaching the commandments of God instead of the commandments of men. It is a beautiful thing to know that our Savior is there with us, that He will be with us no matter what that He is going to strengthen us, stabilize us, and help us along the journey. We thank you for tuning in today. And as always, we invite you each and every day to focus on faith. May God bless. When there is victory.